class, we didn't quite finish inosilicates. So I'd like to just say we're still in the inosilicates. And we're just going to say continued. Because we hadn't finished with the double chain chain gang, a.k.a. the amphibole group. Structure just like last time, going through the structure of the double chains to explain the cleavage because cleavage ends up being such an important criteria for the identification of these minerals, both in hand sample and in thin section. So we'll start off with one general structure. We're going to draw that side view, or that bird's eye view first, and then go to the side view and then connect those eye beams to create the cleavage. So here to start off, we're going to draw our different um, paths, I guess you could say. And then we're going to put our first set of tetrahedra in, and they're touching. And then the second go away. The third come down. We make that nice star. And then we go back out. Uh -huh. And this pattern can continue on indefinitely in this direction or in this direction, where this direction here is the c-axis, basically. Now, this structure we have a lot of oxygens and we have a lot of silicons, but what we really need to get into here is the cations because there are tons and tons of cations that can end up bonding within solid solutions to amphibole. So in the center of the rings, it's called the A spot. And the A spot holds things like H2O. And there's a bunch of M spots, which are other spots for cations. And the way that those are structured, well, that's, we try not to get this too complicated. From the tips, we get this site called M2, which holds some cations. And then there's another site that sits between the M2s. And these are called the M1s. And then there's more spots. You do not need to memorize this. I'm just illustrating it because I want to show you why in the world this structure is the way it is and why the formula gets so complicated. And the reason why the formula gets so complicated is because there are so many different, we're just going to call them cation spots. And all of them can have solid solution with one another. Now at the bottom of this cation spot, we would start up the next line of tetrahedrons, just so you know what to expect down here. Okay. And that would repeat itself. So we have our T O T structure again. Now if we were to look at this from the side view where the c-axis is coming straight out towards you, we need to draw this structure. Tetrahedrons in the front, tetrahedrons in the back, and everything back further back would be hidden behind them. So to draw that, we're going to come in here and we're going to put in our silica tetrahedrons and then some more silica tetrahedrons behind those. Ooh, that was supposed to be a triangle. So if these are in the front, and then these are in the back. And down here, there'd be the next tetrahedron setup. Where we've got some in the front, and we've got others coming behind it. Okay, and that's extending deep into the board, and then coming straight out towards your face. Back and back. And sitting in the middle, between these tetrahedron rings, the silica tetrahedrons, is going to be spots for cations. So there's our M, and we've got our M M1s and our M2s and our M3s, and then we have our A spots that can sit here, A's can sit here, A's can sit here, A's can sit here. And so these A's are things like H2O and potassium and sodium, the bigger cations. Now it's this structure that gives it the fat I-beam known for being a fat I-beam because if we were to trace this out as an I-beam it would be super fat like so and just like we did last lecture this structure stacked upon and stacked upon itself is what gives the cleavage so what we're gonna say here I'm gonna head I'm gonna tell you what we're looking for before we start to draw it we're gonna have a cleavage with intersections at 60 and 120 degrees. Actually, it's 56 and 124, but most times people just call it 60, 120. Much like calcite has, a, has the same type of cleavage angle. And it is because 
the structure is weakest through the cations. So how, how would that look? Well, we can draw a fat eye beam and we draw some more fat eye beams. Basically, they're short and stout. Bear with me. You're drawing it too, though, so I'm sure you can. Let's see, we can put another one in here. And because they're so fat and stout, that's a polite way to say it, right? They're husky. We can put in the cleavages connecting through the cation middles. And you can see that those angles are not at 90 degrees. And instead, they're at 120 degrees and 60. Now, if you want to know what your drawing was really supposed to look like, instead of sloppy, well, that, that actually is not too shabby. This is the actual picture from the textbook that shows that structure with the ABs um, or with the cation spots and then how the fat I beams can create our 6120. Right, where here we go, there is a 60 and here is a 120. Now, the next thing I want to say is, remember how we used the quadrilateral to get the names of the pyroxenes? We can't really do that with the amphiboles because the formulas are super complex. So what I'm trying to say here is formulas are very complex. And one of the important things about these formulas is that they, um, they all have an OH. And in fact, they all have this, they all must have SI8, O22, OH2. They all have that. So you got to memorize at least that part. The other, if you mess up the cations, I mean, that's almost forgivable because it's basically a garbage can for cations. You just stuff them all in there. But knowing that there's OH in the structure has a lot of implications. It has implications for its hardness. It has a low hardness, or at least lower than the pyroxenes because the OH softens it. And it has a lower density than the pyroxenes because... The OH makes the volume bigger, therefore the density must go down. And then what it also does is it lowers the temperature of stability in real petrologic, geologic situations. Basically, the, the, the OH says this mineral is only stable where OH can exist. And it's like in metamorphic rocks less than 600 degrees Celsius, in, in igneous rocks less than 1,000 degrees Celsius. So it lowers the temperature of stability in Ig and meta rocks. This is something that I want you to know it holds true for all of the amphiboles, no matter which type we're talking about. And then now it's time to get into our systematic mineralogy. So we'll go into the species, and the species that we're going to start with is hornblende. Hornblende is a very common rock forming mineral in many different igneous and metamorphic environments. It, um, its chemical formula is darn near impossible, but that doesn't mean I'm not going to make you memorize it, because I am. It has a lot of different cations, magnesium, iron, aluminum, 5, Si8, O22, OH2. At least that part you can never get wrong. Our colors for hornblende is that it tends to be black. Maybe you could see it with some, with some brown colors to it and it is rock forming in igneous and metamorphic rocks. You're going to see it all the time. It's exceptionally common. Now all of the species including hornblende share a couple other things. We're going to look for that 6120 cleavage and then these words are very appropriate. Bladed, elongate, radiating splays. Those words are going to apply to any of the species, so just include them uh, in your mind, at least, for each of our different type of species that we're getting into. Let me show you a couple pictures of hornblende before we move on. Here's some really nice examples of hornblende in hand sample, where we see really nicely 6120, right? Here's our 60 down here, and there's our 120. And in fact, if you were to look at all these little irregularities on the surface, I bet if you looked at them, they would all be 6120. Well, they have to be because it's it's hornblende. And now here is hornblende in a rock. We see these elongated blades. And if we were to look at their 
at their edges, we would end up seeing this 6120 as well. Moving on, let's go to our next mineral. The chemical formulas actually get simpler with each new variety that we're going to talk about. Next up is actinolite. So B, actinolite. This is our green one. So you can bet we're going to lose a little bit of the iron and we're going to gain maybe more magnesium. That ends up what's happening. It's simpler. It's Ca2, MgFe5, Si8O22OH. And we're going to look for shades of green beyond it being bladed with a 6120. Oops, that's not it. That's actinolite. That's delete. That's not the right picture. Here's the right picture. There's a, there's a shot of actinolite where we can see these elongate crystals almost splaying with a radiated splay, but not quite. And it is a shade of green. Actinolite, I'd also like you to know that this is very common in metamorphic uh, mafic rocks. So if you take a basalt and metamorphose it into a green schist, well, you could have epidote, which is green, serpentine, which is green, and actinolite, which is green. So this is a metamorphic mafic rock forming mineral. Last up on the list is tremolite. Tremolite is our light colored it's our white one. So we've got a black one, we've had a green one, and now it's a white. And our white is that's the simplest chemical formula of them all, tremolite. Tremolite is the calcium, magnesium, and member. Calcium 2, magnesium 5, Si8, O22, OH2. And when we see tremolite, look for almost needles now. It's become much more acicular, but it's definitely still elongate. And here we see definite radiating splays of white tremolite in this gray, probably marble rock. And so these two things we're going to put together here in our notes is that it tends to be light colored and it tends to be in marbles, sometimes by hydrothermal alteration as well. But marbles is what I'll have you actually learn for tremolite. Now what we're going to do is we're going to allow tremolite and actinolite to walk us into a discussion of asbestos minerals because we briefly started talking about asbestos the other day because serpentine, chrysotil variety, is one of the forms of asbestos. But tremolite and actinolite present other varieties of it. So what ends up happening for me to tell you what is asbestos? Well, it is a commercial term. In fact, let's put it that way. Let's say it is a commercial term, not a geologic term. It's a commercial term for about six different mineral species. And all of those have a fibrous habit. And that fibrous habit is also known as asbestiform. Asbestiform habit. These fibers can be really flexible, but really strong, like as strong as steel. And so in industry, well, the rocks can be like almost woven together, but then in industry, we use this as a flame retardant. So I wanted to make sure we put that information down and we think about why we need flame retardants. Well, for like oven mitts, sure. But then also for construction, we don't want our buildings to burn down. And so asbestos has been used so much in both, um, in the manufacturing of buildings and then fabrics. So let's just say here that fibers are flexible, flexible, but very strong, like as strong as steel, very strong things. And for this reason, it has been used as a flame retardant. It can't burn, it's a rock, but it can be put in buildings and in fabrics. Well, there's a problem with asbestos though, because it can cause cancer. And so what we want to do is we want to talk about how asbestos is good and how asbestos is bad. And I'm going to start with this picture and we'll take some notes based on this picture. So in general, the fibrous asbestiform habit would look something like this in hand sample. We can see those tiny little fibers that are very thin, making it almost look like silk in this. But it's a rock or a mineral that has you know, no biologic aspect of it all. 
we were to zoom in on these fibers, we start to see that they're highly acicular. And when they're fine grained, like in this picture, less than microns across, you can breathe them into your lungs where your lung tissue can get stabbed and punctured and scarred. And so here's a couple pictures of, like I guess, best of four minerals that have entered someone's lung, and you can see that how the lung is trying to fix itself, the human tissue is trying to heal, it's starting to scar. And it's this process that can actually lead to cancer. So what I want to put down here is some notes about types of asbestos and cancer to just clear it up, because there's a lot of misinformation out there. There are two main, of the six types of minerals, there tends to be the serpentine minerals, and this is chrysotile. Chrysotile. And then there are the amphibole minerals that can also crystallize in this same crystal habit. And it's, the amphiboles account for about 5% of all asbestos that's used in industry or found globally, and chrysotile accounts for about 95%. So most of it's chrysotile. But the thing about chrysotile is that it is safe. You can breathe in chrysotile into your lungs. And because it's serpentine, which has a low hardness, and it's chemically very weak, the serpentine just breaks down. Or I guess you could say your body can accommodate chrysotile asbestos without any harm or damage to yourself. But amphibole, it's not that way. Amphibole is much stiffer and sharper and chemically stable. And so this is a thing that will start to cause damage to your lungs. It, it can scar your lungs and it can cause damage to cells. And it's when you, scarring the lungs is bad, yes, but it's when you damage the cells and causing them um, to, to heal in wrong ways, I'm not this kind of doctor, right? But this is where we can get the carcinogenic amphibole. The good news is it's only about 5% of the stuff that has been used. The bad news is most people don't know that. And so what ended up happening is in 1990, all asbestos was banned. It was banned in 1990 because people started realizing that disrupting our lung tissue and disrupting those cells was causing this cancer. It wasn't first identified in 1990. In fact, the early Roman scientist Pliny the Younger actually noticed that slaves were dying earlier that worked in uh, mines that had a lot of this material. Now, in the United States, there's been about 100,000 deaths attributed to, um, to carcinogenic asbestos, which is why it's horrible. And why we have to get rid of it, and it ended up it, it ends up being that it, people found that it's about ten times higher, like in the normal populace, it's very very low. But in people who work in the mining industry, mining industry that deals with rocks that bear this kind of amphibole, or just normal industrial processes where you're fabricating building materials out of asbestos, the death rate was 10 times higher than background. So it was a real thing. Well, there's been tons of litigation in recent years. Um, where people are having to, they're, they're, they're suing because of their health or, or their death, and that's the right thing to do. Most buildings have, have had all their asbestos replaced. Anyways, I don't need to get into this story too much, but one thing that's going on right now in 2020 is when I'm recording this, is that Johnson & Johnson's baby powder, something we've probably all used, is made up of talc. Well, the chemical formula of talc is, oh, I'm slipping side 205OH. Anyways, that's very, very similar to the chemical formula for, it's 204, I don't really remember right now, I didn't write that down in my notes. It ends up being very similar to the chemical formula for tremolite. And so sometimes talc and tremolite will occur in the same rocks. And so what ends up happening is that some Johnson Johnson's baby powder throughout the eras has had some asbestos form tremolite in it, and Johnson Johnson's getting sued big time. Um, Tens of thousands of people are suing Johnson & Johnson. They're seeking billions of dollars in remunerations for people's lack of health and sickness. And it's just a really interesting intersection between mineralogy and human health. That's something that if you wanted to look into, there's so much more you can learn about it, but not here in this lecture. So I'll see you next time as we go into tectosilicates.